So this morning, I come to a, a section of scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that I be, believe is extremely relevant. Oh, more. there we go. Is that better? Sometimes I'm a little absent-minded. Forgive me. But we come to this passage in Scripture um, that hits on a very sensitive subject matter in our culture today. And before I start into this message, I, I just want to say something. I am so tired of how Satan has ravaged our culture. How Satan has infiltrated even churches and brought trouble everywhere he lands. How families have been rocked and destroyed and how children are in agony because of the issue that I'm going to be talking about today. Families destroyed, children suffering, people betrayed, people wounded, the effectiveness of God's people dis diminished because of this issue. And the Bible says that there will be terrible times in the last days. And we see them. And sometimes we become so desensitized to what's going around us, we don't see the evil for what it is, and it doesn't break our hearts the way that it breaks the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, I've labored through this message in prayer. And I've committed to you that I will preach the word of God in season and out of season. There will be no mirrors or smoke screens this morning. I will call things for what they are. Because God is alive and he is good. And he wants to heal the brokenhearted. He wants to take captive souls and set them free so that they can live abundantly in him. Lord Jesus, I come to you for your strength. Father, your word is true. And your heart is for your people. Lord, help us to see that what we are talking about today, you want us to recognize this subject and the harm that has been done to people through disobedience to you and your way. And help us, Lord, if we need to be readjusted, to be readjusted. And help us to shine like stars in the universe to a culture that is so steeped in darkness and deception. Help us. Jesus, this morning, to hear your word and to apply it. We can't do this without you. Lord, we can't just take principles from your word and apply them to our own hearts and lives without your strength. So we ask God, we ask us, Lord, that your spirit would give us strength. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. 
So Paul, his heart is towards the Thessalonians. He recognizes the work of God that has been done in their lives. And he urges them to live holy lives in less than favorable circumstances. Those people were pressured by their culture on every side, and they suffered because they stood for Christ. And Paul understood that the whole world is under the control of the evil one apart from Christ. God has permitted the evil one to continue his work until the end, and one day Satan will be taken, and he will be bound, and he will be cast into the lake of fire. And on that day, there will be no more evil. Amen. That's something to be excited about. But until that day, there is a catalyst. We have a choice to make. We can either serve the God of this world or we can serve the God of all creation, the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word of God. God presents us with a choice. Why? Because he loves us and he wants us to experience love to him. So we have to have that choice. Paul understood that a very great threat and clear and present danger to the Christian community stood before them. This threat had the potential to negatively impact them, to snuff out the message of the gospel going forward, setting people free and bringing people to at oneness with Christ. The threat that he addresses is just as relevant in our society and churches today as it was in the first century. It's the same. Paul pleads with the church to be attentive to the instructions of Jesus and to obey them. Not just as they already have, but more and more. He wants them to step into the light. For when we step into the light, the darkness, the dark corners are exposed. He pleads with them. We urge you, he says in the Lord Jesus, to do this more and more, for we know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Paul wasn't speaking to the Thessalonians on his own authority. He was speaking to them on the authority of the Lord. And when we open the word of God and we preach the word of God, when we read the word of God, when we study the word of God, the word of God is the authority. And it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what anybody says except for what God says. And there is truth in his word. And we can rest assured that God will have his way. The question is, will we submit to God? The topic uh, he was about to discuss with them is a very serious threat to the personal integrity of their relationship with God and the overall welfare of the Christian community was at stake. What I'm going to be talking to you about, what Paul talked to the Thessalonians about today, is a place where Satan attempts to divide, conquer, and neutralize the effectiveness of his church so that they would not shine like stars in the universe, in the darkness, but that their witness would be be diminished like a candle on a stand with a bowl over the top of it. God wants to take the bowl off. He wants the bowl to come off, folks. We don't put a lamp on a stand and put a bowl over it. It it negates the purpose of the bowl or of the light. The light is to shine into the darkness, even though the darkness doesn't understand it. And what we're going to be talking about today The world does not understand this because they approach things from their fleshly mind. But what I'm going to be talking to you today about is spiritual, deeply spiritual. He launches right into it saying in verse 3, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. You can't go anywhere in our society today without being bombarded by pornography. 
without being bombarded by a message that sexuality is just like a handshake. It has no further connotations. But you're made in the image of God, friends. And God's made you for a purpose. And his purpose is not sexual immorality. His purpose and will for you is that you should be sanctified and that you should avoid all sexual immorality. Sometimes we want to know the will of God. Sometimes we let voices cloud the air and we get confused about whether a voice is coming from ourselves, whether it's coming from our culture, another person, the enemy, Satan, or whether it's coming from God. We get muddled up because all these voices are hitting us from every side. And sometimes hearing the voice of God takes deep prayer and fasting and discernment comes as we pray and fast. And then there's other times when the clarity of the will of God is blown like a trumpet from the rooftops in full unmistakable resonance. And this is one of those times, my friends. There is no room for shades of interpretation on this one. What is sanctification? It is clear the word of the Lord to the Thessalonians and to us today is firstly that it is God's will that we be sanctified. What is sanctification? By definition, sanctification means to be reserved for holy use. The object, objective of every believer should be to wholeheartedly pursue this. To be used by God for his holy purposes in this world. Each believer is called to this. Sanctification demonstrates the urgency to be emptied of anything that impairs being a useful vessel for the glory of God. And putting it in plain language, it is God's will that his people be set apart for his special purposes in this world. You are not your own. You are light bearers. Why? Because the spirit of Christ has been placed in you. Therefore, shine your light. This is the purpose of God in the world that you should be the light of the world. Why? Because he is the light of the world. And you are filled with the Spirit if you belong to Christ. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This is the Scripture very plainly speaking. This begs the question, what then has the potential to pull us in a direction that is opposite to God's desire for us to be set apart for his special purposes in this world? And the answer comes to us very clearly. Paul defines it without hesitation. It's sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality has been around uh, since the fall of man. And in the adult world, I dare say that there is not a single adult that has not been affected by this. There's probably not a single adult that not has, has not failed in this area in their lives. Probably not one. So, it's been around since the fall of man. And although the usage of this term has changed throughout the years, how the Bible defines it will never change. Throughout the Bible, God paints a very clear definition of sexual purity. How do we define biblically what Paul is referring to here as sexual immorality? By sexual immorality, Paul means sexual activity in opposition to God's purpose in all of its various forms, including fornication, which is sexual activity outside of the confines of a marriage covenant between a man and a woman, and adultery, which is sexual activity with others when bound to a faithful covenant with your spouse through marriage. And Paul is directly stating here that if we let ourselves wander from God's ideals when it comes to the expression of our sexuality, we're sexual beings. We are created that way. We're impaired in being a useful vessel for God's glory in this world. 
According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20, sexual immorality is a sin against both our own bodies and against the Holy Spirit. Flee from sexual immorality, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This message is to Christians. When you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you ask Jesus to be your Savior, ownership change takes place. You're no longer owner of your own life. You never are anyways. You're either serving God or you're serving the enemy. People that are not believers in Christ who have not been saved are living in this darkness. The Bible says that people with unredeemed hearts whose, whose lives are continuing on this path apart from Christ cannot see their left hand from their right. They're deceived by the devil and his ways because the devil is bent on killing, stealing, and destroying. But as a believer in Christ, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have life abundantly. God's design for his people is that we live abundant lives that shine, that are filled with light, not darkness. You were purchased at a price. What was the price for your salvation? The creator of the universe stretched, came and made himself flesh. He came and dwelt among us and he he allowed them to stretch out his arms and pound the spikes through his wrists and his feet and to beat him beyond recognition and to bang a crown of thorns and to mock him, to spit on him. He did this. This was the price for your salvation. The God the creator of everything, the only God that, that is or ever will be, the very one that spoke things into existence, that created the whole universe, took a hit so that you wouldn't have to take that hit. His blood was spilt. That is the highest price that is possible. The Bible says that very rarely will anyone die except for possibly a good man. He might, you know, choose to die. But Jesus died for everyone, for the sins of the people. Why? Because he loves us. He wants to reconcile us to himself, and he wants to fill us with his spirit and the light of his spirit. So not only does he save us from hell and eternal separation from him, but he also puts his presence within us. The light of the world. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Bible says, if you are bought with this great price, you ought to honor the Lord with the fruit of your physical being. Honor him. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It's clear God created all human beings with a sex drive. And sex is a wonderful gift from God that was given to us for a wonderful purpose in its proper context. And we could, I could talk a separate sermon about that, but we're not going to go there today because you guys understand what the Christian viewpoint is on this for the most part, right? God binds us together as, as a married couple and there's closeness, and there's family that results from that, and there's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful gift. When we're in sync with God's design for our sexuality, we find harmony with his purposes in this world. And Paul himself kept celibate because he felt as though being involved in a relationship would keep him from full devotion to his calling as an apostle. And there's some people that are given the gift of celibacy and They dedicate their entire service to God so they can serve him more effectively so they're not tangled up with having to worry about the bills and, you know, pleasing your spouse. You know, like, do you want to do this? No, no. you just talk to God. God, what do you want us to do today? (laughs) Okay, let's go. Right, you don't have to worry about 
family or children. Some people have that gift. Most of us don't. Paul himself kept celibate. But he understood that human sexuality and the sex drive was God-given. And this is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 to 5, Paul says this. He says, Now for matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except for perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer and then come back together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Hmm. Okay, the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all. The marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual, sexually immoral. See, sexual, sex within marriage is, is not just the union of the body. It's not just like a handshake, patting on the back. There, there's a spiritual joining, a, a soul I guess you could say a soul binding. Binding. For people's hearts are and souls are, are are bound together, joined together. Together, God's purpose for the Christian marriage is that um, we should follow God together. And that when one falls, and when one's having a hard time, the other lifts that person up, and vice versa. There's times in your life when you're going to have a hard time. And it's always nice to have someone beside you to help you, help lift you up. Because you can guarantee that your, your marriage partner is also going to have those times where they're going to need some help too. And God's purposed for this, and it's, it's pleasing to him. When we sin sexually, we harm ourselves and we put distance in our relationship between us and God and we hurt other people that we sin against when we disobey. And this is why Paul instructs the Thessalonian believers in our text in verses 6 to 8. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject human beings, but God. Did you hear that? Anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God. The very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You may say, I don't go around cheating on my spouse. Oh, I don't do any harm to anyone, really. You know, I watch a bit of porn on the computer. What's the harm in that? I'm going to tell you something. We need to get tough with this as a church. This needs to go out the window. Do you have any idea what is happening when people get involved in that industry? The bondage and slavery that is, is taking place there? Children who are raised in an abusive environment, grow older, and then why not? Because I might as well make money off of it since my whole life has been ruined by it anyway. So let's, and then they get into this thing. They're, they're preyed upon. The whole pornography industry in North America that's so rampant is a predatory environment where people's lives are wrecked. We don't see the silent screams that are taking place behind the scenes where people are wrecked and destroyed, and tossed out like a piece of garbage in the street after they've been used up. Because this is how the devil works. He uses people, he destroys them, and then he tosses them out, and they die. They die. It is not a benign subject. These kids that get sucked into this industry get sucked in because people are consuming it. And it's got to stop. In the church, we cannot 
be partakers of the cup of Christ and the cup of demons at the same time. And it's time for us to stand on this. And no, I understand, you are a fleshly human being with sexual desires. But God wants you to stop right now and turn and repent, and he will give you the power to do it. Why? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. There is no power of darkness that is greater than the power of God. So don't give in to the lie that I can't control this. I can't help myself. Yes, you can. Why? Because you are no longer bound by the chains of darkness. You have been set free in Jesus Christ. It's time that we start to believe what we say we believe and stand on the truth of God's word. Why? Because if we don't, our witness out there will be diminished. Our light covered under a bowl. That's not the purpose for the church. Who's, who's guilty of all this? All of our, our culture is guilty of this. And Christians across the board. I, I, I mean, you look at the, at the statistics out there. This is everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Are you going to face temptation? Absolutely you will. Who is your God? Who is your God? Do you believe his word? Do you trust him to give you strength to be an overcomer in this life? You see, because whether you're out there and you've fallen into something that's hurting your spouse, maybe you're cheating on your spouse. It's hurting her. That's hurting him. And in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. This is God's word, people. This is God's word. The progressive church is not going to preach this. This is so important. Why? Because there's bondage. There's captivity and darkness. You see, there's, not, there's no joy. There's no goodness in sin. There's no goodness. There's nothing good that comes of it. It is only destructive. It is only rendering in, ineffective and unproductive saints. You cannot... Be close to God and be involved in this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, you say food for the stomach and stomach for food and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual morality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Friends, I don't say this as a browbeater. This is a reality check. Like when I'm preaching here, I'm preaching to myself. We gotta watch. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a truth in that song. We need to make ourselves accountable. If something causing you to, to sin, you need to put it away. And you need to come to accountability. Although Paul tells the Thessalonians and all of us today that we are to honor God with our bodies, sadly, so many of us are failing to honor God with our bodies in this way. In a sin-soaked, pornographic, pagan society where so many people are bound by the lust of the flesh, God's people are called to be different. Be in the world, my friends. You can't escape it, but do not be of it. Set up parameters. Guard your children. Don't just say whatever when it comes to watching movies. All that kind of stuff. That's got to stop. It's time for us to get serious about purity. Otherwise, the lamp stick here that is glowing will be removed from its place. Why? Because love calls for obedience. Therefore, if there is a lack of love, there is a lack of obedience. 
And in the revelation, Jesus had returned to your first love. Because if you don't, the lampstick will be removed. That means our church will not flourish. Our church, the doors will shut on this building. Unless we take this seriously. I don't, I don't know about you, but I want to be a light in this world. I don't want to be bound by darkness. I've spent enough time in the past being bound. So have you. Therefore, let your light shine before men. They may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Proverbs, this is the thing. We all know this. But this is difficult sometimes because our culture is so filled with this. And the temptations are on all corners, everywhere. Who is going to help us overcome this body of death? Paul writes this in the Romans, right? And let's look at Solomon. In Proverbs 28, 9, King Solomon, who he was used by God to write a word, he wrote a word in Proverbs 28, 9, saying this, if anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. You want to know why our prayer life is so dead sometimes? Because we're not heeding the instructions of the Lord. We're not living in obedience. You want to burn brightly for God? This has to be, this has to be, but How are we going to do this? Because the good I want to do, uh, ah, I don't do the good I want to do, and the evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing what a wretched man I am. Who can rescue me from this body of death? Paul speaks it out. He lays it out clearly. There is nothing in your own strength, people, that you're going to be able to pull up to make yourself be an overcomer. You're not going to make yourself be an overcomer. The only way that you're going to be an overcomer is by yielding to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, bending your knee before him and crying out to him and saying, more of you, Lord, more of you and less of me that you might increase and I might decrease because I don't have the power in myself to pull myself up. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the gospel because the gospel is the power of God until salvation for everyone who believes. And there is power in the name of Jesus. Because he is Lord and he always will be everlasting till ever, everlasting. He is God. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So don't say that I can't. Because you can, but not on your own. For it is not by might. It is not by power but it is by my spirit. Thus says the Lord in his word. That's what he says. Paul, in speaking with the believers in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 4 says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your, your mind may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Oh. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. As human beings, we put up with it. We listen. Over the centuries, People have constructed many images of what they think Jesus was like, what he looked like, how Jesus taught, how Jesus carried himself. People do this today the same. But like the apostles of old taught, not every Jesus that you hear is the same Jesus. This morning, I want to ask you all of you an important question. Which Jesus do you serve? Which Jesus do we collectively serve? We need to make sure that we're serving the Jesus of the Bible, the correct Jesus. Many today preach about the person of Christ, but in an effort to be culturally relevant, distort his his, messages and his teaching. And this is one reason why mainstream Christianity is so divided. As a religion, mainstream Christianity is filled with so many contradictory teachings, all claiming to represent Christ's message. Tragically. Tragically, and I say tragically, because it breaks the heart of God. God doesn't like to see the destruction that happens when we embrace the wrong Jesus. There's confusion as a result with people who believe in God. 
many of whose thoughts and opinions negate the words of the true Jesus of the Bible. The notion that we can have the biblical Jesus and love the system of this world at the same time is a lie. It will divert us away from the true biblical Jesus. Saying that we love God with our lips, yet at the same time demonstrating hatred towards the same God we say we love by living a life in clear disobedience to his word will result in discipline from God. If you're his child and you're not being obedient, you're going to come under God's discipline. I am too. That's how it works, because God loves us too much just to let us get away with all this stuff. Right? Is this, is this the end game? Is it hopeless? No, it, it's not. You can repent. I can repent. The Bible says if you fail... And if you sin, if anyone does sin, it's not God's will that we do sin, but if anyone does sin, what? He is, yes, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, to, from all unrighteousness. If you're, if you're living in disobedience to God, there's distance between you and him. You may be a child, but you may be miles away from the home, the warmth of his presence and his arm wrapped around you. You may be miles away. Maybe you find yourself feeding in a, in a, a place where pigs are fed, stuffing the, the rotting rinds into your belly to try and satisfy your hunger. All the while your father calls and says, come home, my child, come home. Come home. And he awaits on the road looking for you to return. And when you come, I'm not even worthy, God. I'm not even worthy to be called your child any longer. I'm not any worthy. What happens? The father comes running with his arms open wide and says, my son who was lost is now found. He's come home. Kill the fattened calf. Throw the feast for him. For he was lost and now he is found. That's the love of God for you. That's why he stretched out his arms for you. That's why he gave up everything for you so that you could have that closeness with him. And when you wander, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting your relationship with him, and you're hurting other people as well in the process. Come home. Let go of the things that entangle. Run the race that is set before you. Yes, wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many there are that follow it, but narrow is the path that leads to life, and few there are that find it. the notion that we can love the biblical Jesus and love the system of this world that was established by the enemy of our souls is a fallacy. You cannot you cannot love both. You cannot trudge in both lanes. God wants you to give up yourself. Give up yourself and to give him the rain, the reins, and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is hallowed. You are king. You are Lord. Hallowed be thy name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, I revere you. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, O Lord, not mine, but thine be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, you know our needs. Give us this day our daily bread, the things that we need to survive, the things that we need to thrive. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sin. Forgive us our trespasses, O Lord, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, Lord. Keep us from the evil one. Hide us beneath the shadow of thy wing, O God. But deliver us from evil. Deliver us, O God, from evil. It's all around us. For thine is the kingdom, 
God, it's all about you. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Many of us stand here today and maybe we have been able to put this behind us. But maybe some are struggling. The Lord is calling you to choose this day whom you will serve and to come alongside and say, God, I surrender. I surrender to you because I can't do this on my own. I can't live in this pagan environment filled with temptation and overcome on my own strength. Am I part of the problem? Have things in my life been put before you? God's put before you. Hmm. My fleshly desires that are in con conflict with you? My sports, my hobbies, the other things that so my work? Is this all being put before you, Lord? Put away your uh, idols, people of God. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a soundness of mind. You don't have to cower when the enemy comes. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Therefore, stand strong. strong. Stand strong. Having done everything to stand, put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand against the evil one when he comes at you. Take the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, all these things that God has given to us. Put it on, folks. Your wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and high places. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can be an overcomer. What I'm speaking here is not popular in our pagan culture. I understand that. But he's called us out to be out of there. You're no longer part of that kingdom of oppression and chains and darkness. Put on the armor of light. Walk in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. He's given you his provisions. Some people here need just to bow their heart before the Holy Spirit and say, come Lord God, have everything. I give you my heart. I give you everything, Lord. All I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, B to 11. Paul tells us the truth. And this is the truth that will set people free when we yield to the Holy Spirit. Do, not, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because when Christ comes into you, he gives you overcoming power. And if you've never stepped aside from all these things that I just read here, you have to ask God, like, well, do I truly believe in you? Do, have I ever really repented? Have I ever laid down my heart before you? Because when you do, the Spirit of God will give you overcoming power. And, and Paul says, and continues, he says, and that is what some of you were. Who here was an idolater? Eh. Two hands up. I, in, my, in my flesh, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a chief among sinners, and everyone can say that here too. And that's what some of you were. But you were washed you were washed. You were sanctified. Remember sanctification? Set apart for God's holy purposes. And you were justified by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Justified me just as if you had never sinned. That's the power of the gospel. 
You don't have to live that way any longer. You can be free. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If we were to see the God of the Bible move in our midst, in our church here, in power, if we're going to see our church burning brightly for the glory of God and people coming to this place, throwing themselves down before God and saying, have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner that needs salvation. Which brings glory to God, by the way, when one sinner repents. If we're going to see that before the return of the king. The return of the king is coming. He's coming. Look what's going on in, in God's holy land. Look what's taking place across the face of our planet. Jesus is coming soon, my friends. We can leave, leave no room for compromise. We have been set aside, set apart for God's purposes. We've been cleansed from our sins for those of us who believe. And we have made just as if we had never been a sinner. God takes his robes of righteousness and puts them over our shoulders. And he's put salve upon our eyes to show us what is real so that our eyes could see the truth as he sees it. And the gold, the precious treasuries of heaven have been given to us in the spirit. God's call to us today is to be sold out, not a sellout. This is not a popular message in a culture that wants to do its own thing. I get it. And you're going to be pulled from another direction going, I don't really want to go that far. My Christianity needs to kind of end here. You're ta- what you're talking about, pastor, is radical. You know what? Unless we're radically committed to Christ, there will be no radical change. The radical change in our culture, in our culture here, is only going to happen as the church becomes committed to Christ and his teachings and to live what they say they believe. This is not just window dressing. This is reality. God calls us today to be sold out, not a sell out, brother and sisters. Again, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot do it. If you're friends with the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Christianity, the way God intended it, starts with us denying ourselves, picking up our crosses. A cross is a place where you die on. You die to self. Pick up your cross and follow me. What's God calling us to do? This is what God's calling us to. See, it is not God's will that we go the path of sexual immorality. We see that. That shouted from the mountaintop of his word right here. We don't have to ask ourselves whether this is God's will or not. This is clear. There's a trumpet that's blowing. What is God calling us today? I say yes to you, Jesus. I say yes to worshiping you. I say yes, God, to submitting my life to you. I say yes, God, to committing my, my body to you and serving you with my body. I say yes to being holy, set apart for you, Jesus, and serving you as part of your church, the bride. I say yes to walking away from fornication and adultery. I say yes to laying down pornography. I cannot do this alone, Jesus, but I need you. Without your spirit's assistance, Lord, I will fail. I'll be like Paul who doesn't know how he can overcome in his own self but he came to the conclusion, thanks be to Jesus, the way has been made. Are you tired of being lukewarm? I pray that you are. Are you tired in living in defeat? I pray that you are. Jesus, I just want you to reign in me. I say yes to standing up for what is right regardless of the cost. Remember, O oh church, what God has called you to. To the lofty position he calls you to. To be the light of the world. Remember. Turn away from anything. Reject and push away from the table of the fruitless deeds of darkness. And return to you, the Lord your God, to your first love. Who loves you more than words can say. Amen. Would the team come forward? We're going to close this morning. And I know there's a lot of people here that there's a lot of wheels turning. 
This is a topic that affects everyone in every household. And this morning as we close, God's not looking for, I guess you could say, an outward demonstration. What God is looking for this morning is an inward change. And this song that we're going to sing here, I'm not sure which preacher was the one that would close with every service on this particular song, but this is a song that's been sung many, many times. And if you take it to heart this morning and you take this home with you, and you make this your prayer, I can guarantee you that God will show up and he will give you resurrection power to be an overcomer. Make this your prayer this morning, folks. Would you stand with me as we sing, All to Jesus I Surrender. Lord, to you, we commit ourselves today. We give you our hearts, Lord, everything that we are, everything we have, Lord, it belongs to you. So as an act of worship, Lord, we give you ourselves, Lord, every part of us, our bodies, our spirits, our soul. Lord, it all belongs to you. God, take us in your direction. Father, I just pray for each person here. Father, if there's strongholds that need to be broken, in Jesus' name we pray that they would be broken. Lord, if there's hearts that need to renew their first love, God, we pray that this week, this would not just be lip service, God, but our hearts would be turned to you by your Spirit's power. God, help us to be overcomers. We pray for the filling of your Holy Spirit and your people, that they would be obedient to you this week. Yes, and we pray for grace and peace to rest upon your people. Lavishly, Lord. Father, we don't deserve even to come to your altar, but yet you call us nonetheless. And you say, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For the Lord has rest for the soul. A rest that this world cannot give and a rest that this world cannot take away. This morning, God, as folks go, may this not just be something that we forget and we move on. Maybe something that lasts and makes a huge difference. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.